Thank you for the invitation and happy to be here uh, on this great celebration, for this great celebration. So I thought I would start with this picture. Uh, so I'm much more comfortable with numbers uh, and data rather than pictures, but this is my effort to be artistic. Uh, and I think it captures uh, a lot of what Bob was talking about, which I, I like to think of uh, as a global energy challenge. Uh, and I think the global energy challenge really has it's like you think of it as a stool that has three legs. Uh, the first leg is how can people get access uh, to inexpensive and reliable sources of energy that are critical for economic growth. And you can see there, uh, you can, it's a picture in Beijing, you can fe literally feel the economic growth. Uh, and you can see the cars moving and you can see it wasn't long ago that the guy in the cab was probably on a bike and the guy on a bike was probably uh, walking. And so that's one leg of the stool. Uh, the other leg of the stool is also pretty visible, too, or second leg of the stool is also pretty visible, uh, and that's that uh, you can see the air pollution, uh, and it's not, the air pollution isn't a secret. Uh, the, our, our guy on the bike is very aware of it. Uh, he has on the mask, uh, goggles, uh, the whole thing. And uh, so how do you get that inexpensive energy uh, without, uh, that's critical for economic growth, without unleashing all kinds of environmental problems? health problems. And then the third is a kind of the master environmental problem of all time. It's climate change, and you can't see that. But the same fossil fuels that are powering the growth and they're leading to the air pollution are also uh, leading to CO2 emissions, which are altering the planet. So I'm going to talk about uh, a recent paper that just unpacks one of those legs of the stool. Uh, it's uh, with a bunch of collaborators who are, who are listed there. And it asks, What's the impact of sustained exposure to air pollution on life expectancy? Uh, and it takes advantage of what I uh, is often called in economics a, a natural experiment. So uh, the first thing to note is uh, developing countries have very high levels uh, of air pollution. Uh, and we all kind of have a sense that that's not very good for people's health or well-being. Uh, but when you sit down and think about, well, how would I go about answering that question, it, it begins to get complicated pretty quickly. Uh, and in particular, no IRB, at least in any university that I'm aware of, is ever going to allow one to run a randomized control trial where you can expose people to high levels of air pollution for a long period of time and a second set uh, to no air pollution. So as a consequence, a lot of the studies that have been carried out uh, do not meet that kind of standard uh, of evidence. Uh, and they have relied on kind of short-term variation in pollution, or they've been carried out in uh, developed countries, which have much lower levels of air pollution uh, than we observe in China, and India, and other developing countries. Uh, and so what the idea of this paper was, uh, was to exploit a quirk in a policy uh, that China enacted back in the planning period, uh, when they were much less rich than they are now. Uh, and that uh, quirk was that they had enough money to provide uh, heating in the winter, but only for part of the population. Uh, and so they drew a line across the middle of the country and said everyone to the north of the Huai River, which was this line, uh, gets free winter heating. It'll be provided by uh, coal, very small coal boilers. I'll show you an example of that, without any pollution controls. Uh, and in addition, in, in, in most of the time when this policy was in place, uh, migration was limited or restricted. And so you kind of have a setting where uh, people could not move around in response to the air pollution, and this seemingly arbitrary policy uh, went into place, which was intended to be beneficial to provide heat in the winter. Uh, and so this was established uh, in the planning period, uh, and, and not only did it give free heat to the north of the line, uh, heat was forbidden to the south, uh, although it's worth noting as the market economy has taken hold, heating has started uh, to emerge in the south. Here's an example of a bunch of the boilers they installed. You can see these are not like super efficient things. Uh, they're small little boilers uh, that are installed all over the, throughout the cities. Uh, here's the Huai River, and then it, it extends a little bit, uh, the line uh, extends a little bit as you get west uh, to a mountain range. And uh, the key thing there is if you were to the north, free winter heating, provide it with free coal, uh, and to the south, uh, it was forbidden. Uh, and so what I did uh, was try to collect data, and this took about a decade to do, 
uh, getting access on Chinese health and mortality data is poses some challenges. Uh, but now, uh, in a happy collaboration with the Chinese CDC, uh, we have data from 2004 to 2012. It has a battery of uh, health behavior questions, smoking, diet, exercise, uh, and uh, as well as well as mortality. And that's going to that's going to allow me to infer people's uh, life expectancy. Uh, and then we put together some data from uh, the Chinese environmental yearbooks that have uh, information on their, their own monitoring networks uh, for PM10, which is a form of air pollution that's thought to be the most pernicious uh, for, for well-being. Okay, uh, and so here's just, uh, again, an effort. I'm going to return, or, or really get to data in a minute, but this is an effort to kind of be artistic. Uh, and darker colors here are, uh, so the, the dots, I should be clear, are the places where I observe uh, life expectancy. I don't observe it for everywhere in the country, but these are supposed to be nationally representative. Uh, and the colors reflect uh, the concentrations of PM10. And you can see uh, that actually to the north of the line, there really does appear to be more red uh, than to the south. We're going to take a closer look at that, but there's plenty of red places uh, to the south of the line. And just as a measure of the way in which this policy is a part of day-to-day -day life there, uh, you know, I w uh, several years ago I gave a lecture at a university in Chengdu, and you can see Chengdu is to the, kind of in the middle of the country, but to the south of the line. Uh, and uh, it was in January, and it was uh, just a normal day, and all the students had on winter coats, and there was no heating. That was n no one raised an eyebrow about that. So the legacy of the policy carries on. Okay, so here's my first real effort to be a little bit more systematic. Uh, uh, on the y-axis, we have PM10 concentrations. Uh, it's just mislabeled, it says emissions, but concentrations. Uh, and the zero line there is the Huai River line. And so a positive number on the x-axis means that you're to the north. And a, uh, a, a negative number means you're to the south. Uh, and I'm then taking average, average PM10 concentrations for all of those locations within one degree, uh, one degree bins uh, north or south uh, uh, of the river. And the size of the circle is proportional to the population. Uh, and so what's extraordinarily striking is, wow, this policy really did do something. Now, this is not exactly what it intended to do, uh, but you have much higher levels of PM10 concentration uh, right, right to the north. Uh, and so that's about 50% higher, or uh, 40 micrograms uh, per cubic meter. What is it outside here? It's probably like seven or eight micrograms per cubic meter right now. So these, these are extraordinarily high levels of pollution, and the difference itself uh, is also very high. So now you should know what's coming next. Uh, and so this is like the beauty of research design and the uh, beauty of data is I owe you, absolutely owe you, a figure of life expectancy that's laid out exactly the same and we're going to see if there's a jump in the opposite direction, just like uh, there's a uh, uh, compared to this figure here. And indeed, uh, you know, I like to joke about. Actually, this is a great conference for this joke. But like, I think of data as often, like, if you think back to high school, the worst boyfriend or worst girlfriend you ever had. Uh, and why is that? Because, well, the, at least maybe all of you had better dating careers than I did. But the worst boyfriend or worst girlfriend I ever had would always let me down in a new and unexpected way. Uh, and I, I knew it was coming, I just didn't know why or how. Uh, and so here is like an alternative. Uh, like data has not let down. I had a hypothesis that air pollution was bad. Uh, and data seems uh, to support that. And it would suggest that if you live to the south uh, and uh, to the north and you're an intended beneficiary of this winter heating policy, uh, you live about uh, three and a half years uh, less. Now, the whole game in this regression discontinuity design is, is there not whether or not things are changing to the north or south, but whether or not there's a discrete jump. Uh, and that's what the data appears to be trying to say about both PM10 and life expectancy. So I'm, I'm running out of time, but so let me just zoom through a couple other things that are supposed to make you comfortable uh, with the, that result I just showed. Uh, so I can also look at whether or not mortality rates vary uh, by, at different age groups. Uh, and what you can see, and this I will confess was surprising, uh, is uh, there appear to be largely elevated mortality rates throughout the life cycle, not just uh, among the young and the old. Uh, a second test, and I, uh, we were, uh, my co-authors and I were very proud of this one, uh, mainly because it was embarrassing how long it took us to think of it, but 
uh, we came up with, said, well, why don't we pretend that the Huai River was one degree north or one degree, two degrees north or three degrees north or one degree south, one degree south. And so all these fake tests. Uh, and so the blue is a test whether or not there's a discrete jump uh, in life expectancy at the fake Huai River. And in this case, I guess there's 10 of those fake Huai Rivers. And the red is whether or not there's a discrete jump in PM10 at these other fake Huai Rivers. And you can see there's no discrete change in PM10 10 or uh, life expectancy at any other place except at the zero point, and that's exactly the Hawaii River. Uh, and so that lent us a little extra confidence uh, in, in, in that we may have uncovered something causal. Uh, here's another test, which is just looking at whether you take all the covariates that we had in that data and predict life expectancy except PM, uh, does it look like it's different to the north and to the south? And it looks a little bit, but it would be statistically uh, not meaningful. Uh, and so here's a table we probably don't have time to go through, just showing that there's lots of different ways uh, in which you can implement these uh, regression discontinuity designs. And they largely, in the case of PM10 and in the case of life expectancy, uh, largely give the same answer. Uh, so here's, now here we'll move into like back of the envelope calculation land. So I have this estimate now of what the effect of an extra 10 micrograms per cubic meter of PM10 will do to life expectancy. What if China implemented throughout China a policy that brought its PM10 exposure down to not what we think it should be in the US, but down to China's own standards? Uh, and so China has two standards. One of those is 40, that everywhere in the country should be 40 micrograms per cubic meter, and that's class one, and class two is 70. Uh, if you brought it down to 70, you would increase life expectancy by 1.2 billion life years. If you brought it down to 40, you would increase life expectancy uh, by a t summed over the population by about 3.7 uh, billion life years. So there's a substantial health benefit uh, that would go along with our green grid, which I think we're going to learn about uh, in, in a few minutes. OK, and you know the final slide here is just I, what I like to say about PM10 uh, is that I don't believe there is a greater environmental, current environmental risk to human well-being uh, than PM10. Uh, it's all over the planet. Now, it's concentrated. We've gotten rid of most of it in the US, uh, but in, there's many, many parts of the world. You can see that big belt in India. Uh, there's plenty of places in the Middle East and Africa that have elevated concentrations. In this case, it's PM2.5, but the, the main point is Particulate matter is in places where billions of people live, and I would contend there's not a greater risk uh, to human, environmental-based risk to human health than PM10. Thanks very much. So before we move to, uh, to Sally, Michael, quick question. Uh, you have very interesting data there. Uh, I'm sure you've shared this with the government of, of, of China. Uh, is there any response to it, any, any motion on their part? To yeah, no, I think, uh, so this is the second paper we wrote on this topic. Uh, and the first paper caused quite a stir. Uh, and look, many Chinese, who, they make policy in the way they want to make policy. And there's many mothers of change. But after our paper was released, it is true that the premier declared a, wear, uh, a war on air pollution, and they have since instituted a, a series of policies that have brought down PM10 levels quite a bit. Yeah. 